Welcome to you, all who are new students at the King's College, the class of 2020, entering students, transfers, all those who have come into the fold of what I call the good ship lollipop, the King's College in New York City. To my distinguished colleagues on the faculty, to the staff present in the room, to the house presidents and house leaders who lead these worthy vessels we call the houses at the King's College, welcome. The year of 2016, like every year pretty much, is a year of profound imitation and copycatting. This was the year that my daughter, Carolyn, fatefully on Memorial Day weekend, introduced me, sadly, to Megan Trainer's Me Too, which I have never been able to get out of my head ever since. <laughs> if I was you, I would want to be me too. I would want to be me too. I would want to be me too. <laughs> right? Me too. We live in an age of me too. But it's a me too where we want to imitate someone. We want to copy someone so badly that it reaches a frenzied pitch. The greatest exemplar of Me Too in 2016 is, of course, none other than Kanye, who wrote, I feel like Pablo. Who's Pablo? I feel like Pablo Picasso when I'm designing my Yeezys. I feel like Pablo Escobar, the notorious drug kingpin, when I am doing other things that Kanye does. <laughs> I feel like, and you walk the streets of Soho, and you see people with the I feel like Pablo t-shirts and so forth. I was reminded of this this summer when uh, I woke up early in the morning. The first thing I always do is, is check Twitter, and um, you know, uh, Kanye's Twitter feed is the best, and something evidently crazy had happened the night before because he was supposed to play the governor's ball, it didn't happen because of rain, and he announced that he would be playing at Webster Hall uh, instead. And all of a sudden, thousands of people went on a Pokemon Go-like treasure hunt to find where in the city Kanye actually was because he said he wasn't going to play and then he was moving around. He would tweet out kind of guesswork about his location and literally streets of thousands of people were thronging around him and Kanye was standing up through the sunroof of a car like some kind of uh, second or third or fourth coming of Kanye Messiah. And I was actually concerned for him because I'm like, they are going to kill him because they want to be like him so badly. Something bad could potentially happen. We live in a world where we want to be like. This is true of Christians too. I saw a BuzzFeed video last year that was called, I am a Christian but, and it said, I'm a Christian, and it was a string of people, kind of your ageiness, that were saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm not what you think I am. I'm a Christian, but I believe in science. I'm a Christian, but I drink wine. Trying to clear up all of these perceptions, but really, the bottom line is, I am just like you. I'm not really all of that different. It's kind of a soft way to describe who you are. I am this, but endless string of caveats. This is an age of softness. The great um, now octogenarian Italian philosopher Gianni Vattimo coined a term that summarized this mood of our modern world called soft thought or weak thought. He said this is all that is possible in a modern worldview after philosophers like Friedrich Nietzsche said there are no facts, 
there are only interpretations, and if all that exists are invita uh, interpretations, then we really can't say anything for sure. So the other thing that Vatimo is famous for saying is, I am a Catholic who welcomes the death of God because we can't really know for sure. There are no facts, there are only interpretations. He also coined the term, sort of flipping St. Anselm's dictum on its head, credere de credere. Instead of, I believe, uh, in order to understand, he said, I believe because I believe. Soft thought. Before he passed away earlier this year, another French philosopher, this, is, this was a French philosopher, René Girard, engaged in a sort of a back and forth dialogue slash debate with Vatimo, and the translated title of the book didn't quite capture it. The real essence of the original translation of the title of the book between a Christian, René Girard, and Vatimo, who is a Catholic atheist, and I'm not sure the adjective modifies the noun there, but they had this conversation and it was translated poorly. The real title of the book was Truth or Weak Faith. Truth or Weak Faith. Girard, unlike Vatimo, thought that we shouldn't have to constantly qualify everything that we say about the Bible or about God. On the contrary, he was basically able to persuade Vatimo in the book that Christianity is an unending blessing to the world. All of the things that we modern people, whether you're atheist or so-called secular or whatever, have come to like and love about the world, freedom, democracy, access, technology, sanctity of life, open markets, all of these kinds of things, constitutionalism, uh, limited government, human dignity, and all of these things are only possible because Christianity is a giver rather than a taker. And I th it made me think that Girard should have referenced at this point Shel Silverstein's The Giving Tree. Did you read that growing up? The giving tree, as you know, is this big leafy apple tree. It's, actually, it's at least fruit producing. And there's a little boy who keeps coming up to it. And initially, he, all he wants to do is swing on the branches. And then a couple years later, he comes back and he wants money. And the tree says, I don't have any money to give, but I can give you apples. So he takes the apples and he sells them. And he gets money for them. And then later the little boy grows up a little bit more. Now he's a young man and now he wants to build a boat. So the tree gives away some of its branches. And then the boy comes back and he says, well, I'm settling down. I don't want to swing on your branches anymore. I don't want to have any good times anymore. But I do want a house. And so the tree gives away more of itself until all that's left is this trunk. And at the end of the book, as you remember famously, the little boy is now an old man, and he comes and he's exhausted. He's run out of life and options, and he's now got a cane. And the tree greets him. He's so happy to see him, and he says, I don't really, what, what do I have to give now to you? And the old man says, I don't want anything from you except a place to sit. And so the tree and little boy are reunited. And I think that's a metaphor for our society and its view of Christianity. Christianity is a giver, and unfortunately, society can be a taker without understanding the origins and the source of the giving. But eventually, what's going to happen is society and its experiments against reality will run its course, and in the exhaustion, who is going to be there as a place to rest? That's our job. That's the Team Jesus job. And I think that that's the job that we're up to at the King's College in New York City. And I think that we are up to the job. 
In the meantime, we are living in a world that is all filled with different sorts of competing views of reality, something that's along the lines, if any of you are fans of the novelist Victoria Schwab, she has uh, written a second volume in her magical trilogy called A Gathering of Shadows, and she portrays four different versions of London and their view of magic. There's red London that's pro-magic, there's white London that's sort of like Game of Thronesy. whoever does the best magic wins. There's gray London that's no magic, and then there is black London, which is, shh, she doesn't actually talk about that. That's forthcoming. And we live in this sort of world in which, which there are these competing pagan worldviews in which people are open to all kinds of suggestions, even crazy ones. And where do we stand in that sort of neo-pagan worldview? Well, if I don't miss my guess, I think that you have come to New York City because you are not afraid of the kind of world that we live in because many people your age that come from families of faith would might, might say, you know what, I, I'm not ready for that challenge to be in this in this amazing place called New York City with all of these different sorts of ideas going back and forth. But guess what? Our old friend C.S. Lewis said that we Christians have much more in common with people who live in a pagan worldview where it's filled with all kinds of different suggestions about what reality might be than we would have with the old materialist, old modernist worldview of cold atheism and science. In Time magazine in 1955, Lewis said, Christians and pagans have more in common with one another than either has with the post-Christian worldview. And so as you enter this school year, as some of you enter the King's College for the first time, I am asking you to be giving trees, each one of you, to dedicate yourself in service to situations that will challenge you, that will require more out of you than you think that you might be able to handle sometimes. Sometimes that might come in the classroom of the King's College with the King's College faculty because they're not playing around. They're not going to let you skate. They're going to, they actually believe in the doctrine of human depravity. They know that if they don't hold your feet to the fire, you might not do the work. Unlike Abraham Lincoln, they are not persuaded of the better angels of your nature. So they will challenge you and require you, and you'll be giving to them in a way, and they'll be giving back to you. So we're a community of giving trees, but then we think about this city that we live in, the greatest city in the world, right? New York City. And who is an archetype that we can look to in that situation? My first year I, here, I talked about Daniel and his companions, but for the next few minutes, I just want to briefly talk about another archetype who I think is the most apt for our environment, and that is Joseph. Now, for Christian people and audiences, Joseph is a universally beloved figure, right? So beloved that even post-Christian Broadway musical writers like Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice wrote a Broadway musical called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, right? Which is kind of how the faculty looks tonight, right? With their peacock feathers. I look handsome, I look smart, I am a... Yeah, you know. You know the way that... I think, I think let's see, Paul Gladder wins the prize tonight uh, for most eggshell baby blue. It was red and yellow and green and brown and blue. Joseph's loved by Christian audiences, but did you know that in the Jewish tradition, Joseph is actually viewed with quite a bit of skepticism? Why? Because Joseph actually 
did not look that Jewish. He adopted Egyptian garb. He gave his children Egyptian names. He was not very Jewish at all. And even in his, on his dying day, he's embalmed like an Egyptian, and he is buried in a coffin like an Egyptian. And yet, he saved the Jewish people, but in biblical tradition, if you read Psalm 78, for example, it says that the inheritance, God's promise, is not going to be given to Joseph. It's going to be given to Judah. And in Jewish tradition, the real heroes are Moses, who was in Egypt, was a prince of Egypt, but denied it, fled, and became a shepherd, or Esther, and Mordecai. Mordecai becomes, like Joseph, the prime minister of his day, and yet he's as Jewish as he can possibly be. But I think for us, Joseph is a hero for some important reasons, and I think our current cultural context is a lot more like Joseph's than other biblical characters. And quite despite ourselves, just like Joseph, who didn't want to go to Egypt but found himself there anyway, we find ourselves in a sort of neo-pagan Egypt in the world in which we now live. And curiously enough, and I believe that I have Dr. Drew Johnson to back me up on this, which is the most important backing of all, Joseph did not go into Egypt seeing himself as a savior or a redeemer. He didn't go to Egypt with the notion that he was going to transform culture, that he was going to change it all, turn it on its ear. That's the kind of language that we get from Christians a lot of time, very triumphalistic. We are the heroes, the white knights, you know, arriving on the scene. Joseph didn't see himself that. He was a survivor. And because he was a survivor, any time he had an opportunity to exploit and to take, he took it. And he was happy to serve the interests of a pagan king like Pharaoh, and the good fortune of the broader commonweal of Egypt. He started there, and because he started there, and he was committed to that model, when the famine did break out in Canaan, and his whole former family, who had abandoned him, all except for his father, Jacob, or Israel, when the famine struck and when the people of God were at death's door, he was in the right place at the right time to help. And maybe that can be your job when you stick and stay and succeed, and you will succeed at the King's College in New York City. Your job may be less to change the world and more to find a pharaoh to serve and bless so that you might be in the position to be the best vizier or prime minister one day that you can be. And at that point, you might get a call from God. So. I don't think it would be such a bad thing to start with the service model and to learn from Joseph in these ways. As we live between the times, what can we learn from Joseph? First of all, be a gamer. Be a gamer. Now, you've already heard me say at an Inviso or maybe somewhere else, I think what it means to be Kingsian is to have the attitude that ultimately, ideally, I want to be the kind of person who signs the front of the check, not the back of the check. And that was Joseph. He was a gamer. He sought to 
be involved in things to the point of being in charge, whether he was in Potiphar's house, whether he was in jail, or whether he was in a high position in government. While he was in jail, it was said of Joseph, if anything happened in that place, it was because Joseph got it done. That's a good model to follow. Secondly, the other thing I think we can learn about life from Joseph is that we should go where other Christians fear to tread. Now, the biblical model of Abraham was of someone who was a city dweller who was called out of the city, or of the Chaldeans, to be a shepherd. But Joseph, even though he was thrown into a pit and sold off into slavery, is someone who went from being a shepherd to living in the city. And once he was there, he took advantage of that situation. And that is your job. Take advantage of everything that New York City has to offer because the networking effects are by far and away more significant here than any other possible place that you could imagine. So embrace New York as your home. And in the past, Christians have focused so much on the ground game, you know, Christians are good soldiers, and they start their own wonderful institutions all over the place. But we, by the way, we have a new executive vice president at the King's College. His name is Tim Gibson. And he just came to us from the United States Air Force, where he was a brigadier general. Welcome, Tim and Nancy, to the King's College. You're going to love it here. Tim will like this next analogy. Christians have thought of themselves just as the army. And what we really are in need of in the Christian community, in the church today, is an air force. And where is the air force? The air force is in New York City. It's great to have an army, but the air force is the media. The air force is finance. The Air Force is the world of technology. These are the things that are in a position to speak powerfully to the zeitgeist, the age in which we live. And it's here in New York City. Now, when Joseph found himself in Egypt, here's another thing that Carolyn taught me, he was like one of Miss Peregrine's peculiar children. Nobody wanted a Jew in Egypt. He was a total outcast, outsider. When you read Miss Peregrine, there's these peculiar children, and some of them have abilities that you can't actually figure out what it's good for, like Claire Densmore, who has a, a mouth with sharp teeth in the back of her head. What's that good for? Some of you feel, may feel like, I don't know how my abilities or what I can do can really add up to that much. But I promise you that just like Joseph, here's a Jew who didn't know how that added up to something in Egypt. Believe me, New York City needs people like you who will have a servant attitude like Joseph. Thirdly, Joseph co-opted pagan ideas and made them faithful. You know, if you read throughout the, the Torah, you're not allowed to practice divination. That's bad. You know, sorry, Professor Trelawney, but there is no divination allowed. I mean, you're not supposed to have a spirit of divination, and yet Joseph is able to do it, but in a way that gives glory to God. Redeploy all of the ideas that you learn from employers in New York City and from your studies in the classroom and subvert them and re-engage them so that you can use them to be a faithful servant like Joseph was. For example, in Joseph's story, he's a dream interpreter, right? 
And so um, I don't think you should start a tarot card business, right? <laughs> you, shouldn't, you shouldn't consult mediums or we ju that's not what I'm talking about. What would dream interpretation look like today? Well, maybe it might look like something along the lines of what the great Yale computer science professor David Gelertner mentioned in his new book about the tides of mind on consciousness. He said, there are high tides of consciousness when we're really awake and there are low tides as we go to sleep and we wake up. But the truly creative stuff, the associative stuff, that creates new ideas and is the most creative are at low tide, right before you get to sleep and right when you wake up. What if we could harness that? Well, Joseph did that. He used associative insights to do economic planning. He did dream interpretation, captured that, and helped the Pharaoh develop an economic plan that benefited the whole people. And lastly, we can learn from Joseph to stay blameless in our conduct. Joseph was a scapegoat. His brothers hated that his father loved him more than them, or at least they thought so. So they scapegoated him. They made him a victim so that they could succeed or be loved or have what he had. But in the face of scapegoating, and listen, this is the most important thing that I have to say tonight. In the face of scapegoating, Joseph maintained a blameless conduct. He did not whine. He did not complain about his misfortune. He did not bemoan to everyone his situation. He moved forward and kept his com conduct virtuous so that when he rose to a position of power, he was able to break this cycle of scapegoating that his brothers had started and gave them a chance to be virtuous, maybe for the very first time. Because as you remember in the story, Benjamin he is, is caught He's set up with this golden cup or silver cup in his sack. And his brothers have the chance to sacrifice young Benjamin again so that they can live to fight another day. They've got all the food that they want. They can go back to Canaan. And they learn their lesson, and they decide not to scapegoat their younger brother, but to take responsibility. And so Israel becomes what Israel has become to this very day. The Jewish people are a people of responsibility, focusing on blameless conduct in the world. So in conclusion, what can we say about Joseph? Well, Joseph didn't change culture. I mean, you know, the Pharaoh didn't kneel down and pray the sinner's prayer, right? We can't see any evidence of the fact that, you know, Jew the Jewish worldview was in a more privileged position at, at the end of Joseph's life. He didn't do that. But somehow, unwittingly, because he was blameless and because he was a gamer and because he was willing to wade in, when the people of God needed a champion, he was in the right place at the right time. We may not change culture. We may not see everything turn around so that it's, it's the sort of flourishing that we would hope and dream and would pray for, even pray for. But maybe your job is to be an example in the greatest city of the world that someone who is faithful to God can compete and be found blameless. And it might be that your generation's job will be to make sure the church and the people of God survive the coming trials, the famine of our generation. 
as Dr. Drew would tell you, Joseph didn't intend to save his people, but he did the right thing, and God used that to do the saving himself. And so we must trust in the Lord so that at the end of your life, you can have something that is far greater than all the things that we sell and promote as being the distinctives of coming to the King's College, the opportunities of New York City. You want something more, as the New York Times op-ed columnist David Brooks has said, yes, the resume virtues are important, but your peers that are at other institutions, that's all they're interested in, resume virtues. You should be cultivating here the eulogy virtues. When your bones are laid to rest in Egypt, what will people say about you? What will be your epitaph? By God's grace, may it be, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good, for the good of his people. Will you pray with me? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Eternal God, would you so see it fit to superintend in such a way that these students of the King's College in New York City might be up to the job and be characterized by excellence to the glory of God, even as we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us, poor sinners. Amen.